All right, well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another part of Wisdom of the Ages. We will eventually get back to um, the Tao and change your thoughts, change your life, but uh, this is what I'm reading at the moment, and so I'll share it with you if I can, if you're interested. All right, so today's chapter is called Enlightenment. Enlightenment. Last one was Divinity. One before that was Being Childlike. The video before that was Triumph. Each of these has been wonderful in their own way. Now, Enlightenment. <clears throat> I'm excited about this one because this is the this is the ultimate topic, right? All right, let's just get into it. Before enlightenment, <laughs> everybody who knows me has heard me tell them this once or twice before. It's a Zen proverb: before enlightenment, chopping wood, carrying water. After enlightenment, chopping wood. Carrying Water. Founded in China in the 6th century and widespread in Japan by the 12th century, Zen Buddhism emphasizes achieving enlightenment by the most direct possible means. I love that sentiment. Before and after enlightenment, you must be chopping wood and carrying water. Whatever your destiny version of chopping wood and carrying water is. Um, there's another quote. I think it comes from the Bhagavad Gita, but it says it's far better to do your work imperfectly than it is to do somebody else's work more perfectly. But it's all chopping wood and carrying water. Now, as I study the phenomena, Wayne Dyer begins, of higher states of awareness and what is generally referred to as being enlightened, this simple Zen proverb, <laughs> don't mind the lights here, this simple Zen proverb is always a great source of pleasure for me. When we think of the elusive thing called enlightenment, generally we are referring to a state of consciousness that we will someday achieve if we adopt the right spiritual practices and work diligently toward becoming enlightened. The expectation is that when we are fully awakened, all our problems will disappear and we will live a life of pure bliss. But the message of this famous proverb is that enlightenment is not an attainment, and that's a key point to remind yourself of when I joke about the 60 days to enlightenment it's enlightenment is not in attainment let me find where I was it is a realization so it could happen instant it could happen in an instant or it could take an entire lifetime Once you reach this realization, everything appears to have changed, yet no change has taken place. It is as if you have been going, it is as if you had been going through life with your eyes closed, and then you suddenly opened them. Now you can see, but the world hasn't changed. You simply see it with new eyes. Change your mind change your life. And the key thing to remember, I'll add right here, um, with that in mind, you simply see it with new eyes, is that you will find what you look for. This proverb about chopping wood and carrying water says to me that enlightenment does not begin in a lotus position in a cave high atop the Himalayas. <laughs> it's not something that you will get from a guru or a book 
or course of study. That's why I joked in the beginning about the 60 days to enlightenment. It's not something you will get from a book or a course of study. Enlightenment is an attitude toward everything that you do. The state of being enlightened, for me, says Dr. Wayne Dyer, involves a very basic idea of being immersed in and surrounded by peace at all moments in my life. And I try to remind myself of that in my life. Can I choose peace rather than whatever emotion is wanting to pop up out of the 10,000 things in the mind? The, all the attachments? Peace. Am I really enlightened if I'm not peaceful? If I can't be here now in the moment rather than extrapolating myself into the future or the past and attaching to those things with erroneous emotions? Hmm. The state of being enlightened for me involves a very basic idea of being immersed in and surrounded by peace at all moments of my life. If I am anxious, stressed, fearful, or tense, I am not realizing the potential I have for enlightenment right in that moment. I believe that becoming aware of these non-peaceful moments is one of the ways to being an enlightened person. Ah, I want to say that sentence again. I believe that becoming aware of these non-peaceful moments is one of the ways to becoming an enlightened person. Part of the process, I believe. Bring this a little closer here. And in general, no, I lost my spot again. <laughs> I keep losing my spot here. Mmm. In the moment. See, it all comes down to the moment. Becoming aware of these non-peaceful moments. Realizing that you are not control in the moment. And you could choose peace or choose a different way in the moment. These are all high-level abilities that I would say most people barely think about, if ever. <sighs> I have heard it said the difference between an enlightened person and an ignorant one is, the, is that one realizes he is ignorant while the other is unaware of his ignorance. <laughs> I have felt a deeper sense of inner peace and enlightenment in recent years, and still I chop wood and carry water, as I did when I was a teenager. Every day I still do the work that will pay the bills, even though the work has changed and may look entirely different. I added that entirely different part. Each day I exercise to stay healthy, eat properly, brush my teeth and wipe my own behind, he even says. <laughs> In the past 30 years since my first child was born and right until now, with seven more children to raise, I have the same basic concerns. I didn't know Wayne Dyer had eight children. That's intense. How to protect, feed, advise, and deal with them. I continue to chop wood and carry water as a family member concerned with their lives. As a family member concerned with their lives. Ah. Enlightenment is not a means to eliminate life eliminate life's daily tasks. So what does an enlightened outlook on life do for you if it doesn't eliminate daily chores and lead you to a contemplative, problem-free life? And I'll jump in there. That's the, see, that's the one thing, that's the spiritual materialism I think people get when first coming into the enlightenment-seeking that's kind of why I stopped saying seek to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment, because it, 
it sounded like a, a reaching, like you're trying to grab it and get it in attainment, which isn't, um, which isn't it. It doesn't eliminate the daily chores. It, it, you don't end up floating on a cloud. That's the way that Matt Belair puts it. Shout out to Matt Belair. That's the way that he puts it. It's, it's like a, at first, you know, you, you think you're going to find enlightenment and you'll be in this blissful all is oneness and it's all just a cloud experience. But that makes me think of the ten bulls proverb. I think it is. But like the all the they were all steps all the way to enlightenment, and then later in history they added coming back from enlightenment and still existing in the world with the higher perspective. So that way you can uplift the world. That's I believe the true purpose of enlightenment. Not escaping the world, but being in it in a whole new way. Now, in general, enlightenment will not change your outer world, but you will change your way of processing the world. For instance, as I go about the business of parenting, I see my children with an absence of ownership and attachment, whereas previously their behavior could rule my emotional life. Now I see my eight-year-old's tantrum as what she has to do right now to get attention. I don't feel compelled to join her in her emotionally juvenile conduct. <laughs> I also see the successes that all my children experience from this more detached perspective. I think maybe we could all attempt to adopt a more detached perspective. I'm not sure what angle to do the camera here. Maybe we'll do it a little lower there. <sighs> My realization of detachment is not an attitude of indifference. It is one of knowing that I have the power to choose peace for myself in all moments, and that I will still have all the same activities, problems, and events cropping up each day, as long as I am in a physical body, I will have some chopping wood and carrying water to do, as will each of us. But the way of approaching it is what constitutes enlightenment. Mm. We will all have chopping wood and carrying water to do, but the way of approaching it is what constitutes enlightenment. I can recall the horror that I once experienced when having to change a particularly messy, dirty diaper, or, heaven forbid, having to clean up the floor after one of the children decorated it with unpleasantries. I would say I simply can't do those things. They'll make me sick, and either I avoided them, or if that was impossible, I literally responded to the olfactory insult by getting sick myself. It is amazing how such an attitude affects your physical reactions, as well as making the tougher duties of parenting unpleasant. <laughs> Some of the details he goes into. Hilarious. Uh, today I can approach a dirty diver or a pile of noxious throw-up with a completely different attitude. And the most amazing thing is that I no longer have the same physical reactions as I once did. Strictly because I changed my thoughts. Mm. The diapers are there before and after enlightenment. <laughs> as is everything else. But in post-enlightenment times, you can bring to the task an air of detachment and peace is your result. He says here, I love this affirmation from A Course in Miracles. I can choose peace rather than this. To me, that one affirmation sums up this whole business of enlightenment. Being able to choose peace while carrying chopping 
cleaning, delivering, hammering, or any of a zillion things that you could add to the list. I would also say the other most important aspect of enlightenment from my perspective is the non-subjective viewpoint being non-particularized if if the universal intelligence is universal then it there's nowhere that it's not it's everywhere in all things so there is no particularization there's no this playing card is better than the book or i'm better than in, the flowers are just the same and one as everything else. There is no particularization. And that's another thing I learned from Wayne Dyer. It's like, we have to learn how to adopt an intelligence that doesn't know how to particularize. From a particularized point of view... Of our ego and we have to do this with our ego and it's not going to want to let us do this because if we get rid of the particularized point of view it's ego death no more survival and so the ego thinks you're gonna die you can't get rid of me and so it's a constant looping of a non particularized point of view to the survival of the particularized point of view but we have to figure out how to not be a subjective experiencer only but at the same time be an unattached experiencer I'm losing my words anyways let's get back to it Enlightenment is not something that will set you free. Rather, you become freedom itself. Mm, perfect. You do not become an eagle in the sky. You become the sky itself. Put my finger there so I can remember where I'm at. But the, the lake, when there's... Yeah, like in the painting up there, when the mountain is reflected on the water... The water retains no memory of the mountain. It just happens. Much like the water has, or the mountain has no intention of reflecting itself, it just is. When the geese fly over the lake, they have no intention of reflecting themselves, and the lake has no mind of reflecting them. It all just happens automatically. The Tao does nothing, but leaves nothing undone. <laughs> you, can, you do not become the eagle in the sky. You become the sky itself. You no longer define yourself by the boundaries of your body, the, sub, the subjective, the particularized point of view. The universe itself becomes your body. You are now connected in a profoundly spiritual way to all that you see and do. That makes me think of the Force. Some of the things Yoda says about the Force. It's connected to all things. The universe itself becomes your body. You are connected profoundly in a way to all that you see and do. You begin to treat all your tasks, even the most mundane, as opportunities to know God. Or whatever the name is you call it. Source, Universal Intelligence, Luis, Content Floss. <laughs> what a, that, the, the Tao that is named is not the Tao. Ah. <sighs> You no longer define yourself by the boundaries of your body. The universe itself becomes your body. You begin to treat all tasks as opportunities to know God. You bring peace to everything since 
in your own mind, you are everything and everyone. You become less preoccupied with labeling the flowers and trees and more involved in experiencing them. This simple little Zen proverb, and I'm telling you, this chapter right now is powerful one. This is hitting me home. I hope it's getting you. Smash the like and let me know. Drop a line in the comment. This simple little Zen proverb, which has been handed down to seekers of enlightenment for thousands of years, is a great gift. Inside or outside yourself, you never have to change what you see, only the way that you see it. And I'll add, your ability to choose to do so. That is enlightenment. To put this simple Zen proverb to work in your life, here are a few equally simple strategies to practice. Love how he always does this at the end of his chapters. Ah, wisdom of the ages. Become aware of your ignorance as it reveals itself each day when you have allowed yourself to slip away from the being at peace. Note who you blamed for your moments of despair what the occasion was and how frequently you fell into this trap. The recognition of your unenlightened moments is the way to begin turning them to enlightened moments. Remember that those who are ignorant are generally unaware of their ignorance. The key is to become aware. Let go of your inclination to see enlightenment as something that you will achieve at some future time when your life circumstances change to the better. Do the same, I'll add, do the same with happiness. Happiness is the way. You choose, let go of your inclination to see enlightenment as something that you will achieve at some future time when your life circumstances change for the better. You will always have some form of chopping and carrying to do. Your choice is in how you elect to see it. Practice making specific changes in your personal approach to things that take you away from your peace. For example, if you find yourself being excessively annoyed in heavy traffic or in long lines, use these ordinary circumstances of modern life to shift around your inner world. Become Unattached from yourself momentarily, especially the emotional part. Allow the emotions, but do not become them. And they will flow out of you, and especially the negative ones. It's like, it's a reciprocity. You have them and release them. If you don't allow yourself to feel them, they don't get released very easy. But that doesn't mean when you're feeling them, you get uncontrolled and tantrumed. You feel them from an unattached perspective and release them. This is the Jedi way. <laughs> Anger is only the true enemy. No, sorry. Practice, all right, third recommendation here. Practice making specific changes in your personal approach. Take... <laughs> to things that take you away from your peace. Annoyed in heavy traffic or in long lines, reserve a space within yourself to appear. I'm saying this again because this is a tough one to do and it's a tough one to understand. In the moment, when you catch yourself, reserve a place within yourself for enlightenment to appear in the moments when you're typically opt for anger, upsetness, anguish. And finally, the fourth recommendation, never make announcements about being enlightened. And that's a difficult one, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I held back on the seek to achieve and maintain enlightenment through happiness thing. It's a good philosophy, but you got to be careful with words. Because the person who says, I'm enlightened, 
is definitely not. It's like claiming you're humble. I'm the most humble person there is. I never brag about myself. <laughs> you, you cancel it the second you do it. Choose not to engage in conversation about your enlightenment. I choose to engage in conversation about sh the path, possibly, to enlightenment. I do it for purposes of teaching and commentary. I want to see more happiness in the world. I feel a responsibility in that area. Sorry, I had to, I got attached. I had to defend myself the second day. <laughs> One Zen teaching says that only after a sincere seeker has asked you more than three times should you respond. Mm. The sages are silent on the subject of their own level of God realization. And I think that's the key. I will not make any claims to my level of enlightenment. Shoot, I think I'm still quite a bit of a young learner, young Padawan, maybe even a fool. <laughs> ah, and that's the end of that one. The next one will be called The Now. And I'm excited for that one too. Enlightenment, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you liked that one. I really did. Consider subscribing. Smash the like button. Let me know what you think down in the comments about enlightenment. I listed that painting yesterday on my Etsy shop. I'll see if I can link that in the comment section if you're interested in owning any one of my paintings. And I'll have to get to listing another one and doing some painting videos. If you don't know, I do a painting channel, CLC Paint YouTube channel. And this is the Chase Corrington YouTube channel. I'll do it anyways, where we seek to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment. And seek to understand the wisdom of the ages. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. I'll be back in the future with more interesting things to throw your way.